This is my Navy log. I never did see any of that stuff in the air but down there, but it was there. The later air station was there. I never did see any of them flying around. But. Yeah. You have an odd accent. Huh? You have an odd accent to me. Your voice. Oh. Uh, where, kind of, where were you raised? California. That'll, that'll do it. <laughs> it's not southern anyhow. Naval Air Station in Atlanta was so busy building it and trying to fly people out of there back and forth till my instructor took me over to Canada Field, which is now Hartsfield to shoot touch and goes over there. They, they, they didn't even have a tower. Mm -hmm. Hospital didn't. Now it's the biggest airport in the world. Yeah. I was never on an aircraft carrier. My brother was on one. Well, I landed on the carriers. I think in that it says qualified for uh, Aircraft carriers, something. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Could you guys land on an aircraft carrier? What? Could, could you? Could you land on an aircraft carrier with those things? With a blimp? I, I, no, not with a blimp. With a fighter. Yeah. I I flew heavy in there, and I went into fighters rather than dive bombers or torpedo bombers. Oh, I see. And at that time, they, you had a choice of fighters. It was a Corsair, the FM-2, which was a hopped-up F-4F, and T-6, I mean, F-6F, which was a fighter, a Grumman fighter. Uh -huh. Well, yeah. never built a saw airplane. It's the only air what did they use the blimps for? Big pump. What did they what did they use the blimps for? You patrolled the coastline? What did you use blimps for? Yeah. Did you patrol convoy, up and down the coast? Convoy and any sub. Okay. Oh that's good would be good, yeah. Oh. Uh, if and during the day we tried to keep them submerged in the proximity of the ports, uh, they would run on the surface to charge the batteries out some distance from shore because they couldn't patrol the whole world. But anyhow, the Norfolk, I was stationed in Little City, North Carolina, which our detachment escorted out of Norfolk which was our biggest embarkation port during the war, east or west. And I would, during the day, we had flights going out three, four hundred miles trying to keep the subs under the water so they couldn't charge their batteries. And then at night, they would surface and hightail it towards the port and try to torpedo uh, at night. In fact, when they first started the Annis Hitler, first started his Annis sub work, I was stationed at Lakers instructing. And you could fly out from Cape May to New York and see five ships. The superstructure was still surfaced, but five ships that had been torpedoed that night. And the next day you could go out and there'd be 10 oh. out there with this superstructure in that, just in that area. Yeah. They were thinking of man, I mean, right and left. You found them if you found them? We carried four 325 pound depth charges. 
but if we had made an attack, which one Navy pilot did on a sub, he was doomed. Uh, the blimp was doomed. The sub could shoot him down. They had oh. a respectable anti-aircraft batteries on the sub. Okay, yeah. So we we couldn't fight it out with a sub. Uh, all we could do was detect. And if he went, if he surfaced, I mean, submerged, and we were close enough, we could drop depth charges. But you see, the destroyers used 600 pound depth charges, and they were a lot had a lot more zing than right. our 325. Right. But some of those flights, I believe my last flight of now flight was 23 hours, something like that. Oh. 21 hours. Is it D? Is that a number of machines? Anyhow, we stayed out a long time, and uh, boy, one the Collier Trophy was a student of mine when I was instructing at Lakers. He went with a squadron after he graduated, and flew. Almost halfway around the world in a blimp. Wow. And won the Collier Trophy after the war. Yeah. Hmm. I had a fight with Admiral Who. There was a big <coughs> balloon gondola in the Smithsonian. It's a big ball, metal ball, and two pilots, an army and a navy pilot, took it into the stratosphere oh. in the late 30s. Admiral Sever, he came to Lake Earth from Washington to get his four hours in. And I was instructing, and they just threw out one of my students, and he got in with me. And he slept the whole time we were instructing the students. But he was famous. Uh, you probably don't know him, but in the Smithsonian, they got right up and that big sphere up there, where in the late 30s, they went into the stratosphere. But he got a flight with me one day to get his four hours. You couldn't get flight pay unless you had <laughs> at least four hours a month. Right. <laughs> it's got writing on it. Oh, there it is. You find it? Yeah. That's a short snorter. You ever heard of it? I have not. What is it? When you cross the equator, uh, everybody signs a, a bill. That's a, I was flying Max sure. somewhere and went across the equator and I got the two. Matt Pollock's signature and everybody that was a passenger on the plane. Okay. Including me. That's a short snorter. That's what they call them. A short s snorter. Now, when we cross the equator, we have uh, you, the ones that haven't crossed yet are called polywogs, and then after you cross, you became a shellback. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't well, that, on, on a ship, if you cross on the ocean, on a, on a oh. ship, 
Then your for your poly butt log you became a then you became a shell back. Yeah, yeah, right. You, did you ever read about the fighters that hooked on under the dirigible and were pulled up into a hangar in the belly of the dirigible? No, I never heard of that. We built some dirigibles yeah. between the walls. They were steel structures with gas lifting bags inside the steel. And they made five hangers inside the belly of that airship. And the planes had hooks over the top wing and could fly up in there and hook and they could pull them up into the belly of the dirigible. Not a blimp, a dirigible. A dir yeah, the big dirigible, yeah. So the skipper of that hook on squadron was my first commander in the Navy. And his name was Harrigan. D. Ward Harrigan. Went on, he was a Napa's man, went on to make Admiral. Funny thing happened to me. So I flew and instructed in blimps a while, and I flew airplanes a while. There were two different categories. Okay. And I had to stay in 10 years after the war. That was my contract with the Navy. And every summer I would leave dental school or wherever I was and take two weeks Navy training. Well, I preferred the heavy in there. In Atlanta they had a unit and I could fly on the weekend and put in time on a fighter. Uh, oh, well, <laughs> one summer I put in for two weeks active and they didn't have anything open in the fighter. And so they sent me to Lighter Than Air. And I had been in Lighter Than Air for four or five years. Yeah. Well, I was in the duty office checking on the station at New Jersey. And they said, aren't you qualified in free balloons? I said, I can fly anything on the damn field. Well, leave your stuff here. I'll take it to the uh, quarters, headquarters for you. And go out there, they got a ship, a free balloon that's getting ready to launch and the pilot got sick and they don't have a power. And a free balloon, I don't know whether you know what it is or not, but it's a balloon filled with lifting gas. Yeah and a wicker basket about four feet square and it carried about 30,000 feet of whatever you wanted to lift with. They had had two that exploded with hydrogen. Hydrogen gives you the most lift, but they had had two of those exploded, six men in each one. But I was just checking on the station. I didn't know what it was filled with. I ran out there with my dress blues on, and introduced myself, and there were six of us in the basket with sandbags, of course. And before we, there was so much going on, I forgot to ask the chief what was his name? What, what kind of gas we had? 
and I took off and didn't know what kind of gas we had. And one of the ranking officers in there got his comb out. I said, pardon me, uh, Commander, but we don't have any hair combing. Hello. We don't have any hair combing on this flight. You might generate a spot. <laughs> so he didn't comb his hair. Anyhow, we took off and made landings and takeoffs, which is they want you to do that for the training. And you could get up there on a nice day with about a two knot wind. You could take a handful of sand and just dribble a little bit and you start going up. And you could reach up and get that valve. It had a valve and the top of it about that big. And just say, pew, about that much. And level off, pew, again, and come down. It's beautiful fine. You could, if you had to urinate, you had to get the skipper's permission because when you urinated, you got light, it started going up. <laughs> but it wasn't too much of that going on. And I could go to Atlanta when I was flying reserve and check out a fighter any time I wanted to. Usually a boy named Bill Dilts, Bucky Dilts, his son, younger brother, played football at Georgia. Bill Dilts and I knocked around on together a good bit. And he and I would use it, check out a fighter each and go up and go fight. <laughs> That was a lot of good fun. I had a buddy I was in light of the air with and heavy in air. He's from Iowa, Bill Gamble. And we were aviation cadets in the 40s, way back. I'm crazy about Bill, but we were competing all the time and we could go check out a F6F. F. And if I do say so myself, I could get on his tail every time, it made him mad as hell. <laughs> Did you ever have a dog fight with the Germans? No. <laughs> I'm afraid they were to cook a goose. But if you could ever get behind one, with those 650 caliber, I'm telling you, six of those converging, you're going to tear up some, tear up some real estate. Yeah. <laughs> wow. When I was growing up, I built marbles, and I always wanted to fly a World War I fighter. Wow. That's what marbles we were building when I was growing up. I was, 27 years old, something like that. And I looked for airplanes for sale. You weren't about to find a World War I fighter. Right. There was a paper that they put out. What was the name of that thing? A yellow sheet. Any of that. That's neither here nor there. But uh, I said, well, I'll just build me one. So I found a rotary engine. You know what that is? Yes, sir. Yeah. And the prop. And I found more machine guns than I needed. <laughs> but I found some machine guns. And I was off and running. I actually made the wheels myself. I ordered the spokes and rims from England and built me a jig and tightened them ding, 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 ding. Wow. 
to I built my wheels and I built me a World War One fighter, Newport 24 bis. And I flew it. Wow. Uh, but it was it was different, I'll tell you that, boy. What? And I flew it at some air shows and I went to to Alabama for wow. one and Gunner Von Braun was there and he was interested in the airplane and asked me a lot of questions about about the flying characteristics and uh, I wasn't too good to tell him about all I was trying to do is stay alive. <laughs> tell him about your experience dropping dip charges. You're talking to me, Henry? Yeah. What, what was the question? When you were dropping dip charges. The, dropping your dip charges? You mentioned yeah, that you I, dropped I tried some. to go across at about 30 knot speed to get out of the concussion. We carried three 325-pound depth charges, but destroyers carried 650-pound depth charges, and needless to say, they were more effective. But the only way I could use a depth charge was run across it and drop a stick of them. Uh, and get on out of the way because man it when that thing went off it shook and if I had to be careful to be stay away from a death from a destroyer dropping those 600 pound death charges because he would have blown some of the gas out of my lifting uh -huh. quarters. How